Okay. We we've even got a bumper now, so there's this cool little video that plays on the on the oh, end. Oh wow! So yeah, yeah, that's I'm gonna thank Paul for that. He he's the one that that reminded me to download that. So now I've got that added in. So well, awesome. good morning, Mark. How are you, sir? Good morning. I'm fine. How are you? Good. We've we've already had quite a Twitter exchange this morning about well about my T-shirt. <laughs> actually, my T-shirt is is something that's kind of familiar to both of us. That's oh. that's our caffeine molecule there. I I pulled this yes. out of the closet just for you. Oh my gosh, I, I I wonder if I still have mine. I, I had one like that and I loved it, but it got so worn that I finally got rid of it. And when I found a replacement, I bought it. Uh, but but now that you mention it, it might have gotten like filtered to the bottom of the pile again. So I need to go hunt for that. I probably still have it in there somewhere. I'm it sure you do. I'm sure you do. Presentable enough to wear in public, but it, you know, I, there are certain things you kind of hold on to. Well, that's <laughs> that's the beauty of our virtual life. I mean, it's it's sort <laughs> of true. presentable, but sort of not. And and you know, Mark, you're a big enough deal that my my cat decided to pair with us today. So we we've got we've got Han in the background. He's just going to hang out there. He's a little mad at me because I pulled the blinds, and so. You know, it's ever so slightly cooler for the cat. So he's, he's just, you know, we'll see how long it takes before he decides to come across the desk here and bump my, my mic and, you know, uh, mash on my keyboard. But Well, my dog is over here, but the, the problem is I can't move my camera easily to, to, to pan over to her. So we'll just, she says hi. Well, she would if she were awake, but. <laughs> uh oh, we've got, we've got Tasha on the stream today. She, she's watching. This could be crazy. What? Uh, Oh, oh, I'm sure gosh, we have to this, behave then, right? And well, a little bit, and and uh, we're also being told that we need to keep the conversation strictly to coffee. So I, I guess oh, we'll start oh. there. Mark, what'd well, you have this morning? What would you? That's that's a real sacrifice, but we'll do what it we is. can do. It so. is. <laughs> that's the no, interesting. I'm... Can you and I talk for sixty minutes about nothing but coffee? Hold uh, my coffee. Oh my gosh, that's just that's that's not even a challenge. Hold on. So so yeah, let me see if I can pull up this photo. I have this glorious coffee that actually Tasha turned me on to here. Let's see if I can. Oh, uh, your no, your that's... filter is saying ha ha. Yeah. Zoom it's, Zoom it's doesn't like fun. that. Well, let me let me fix let me just remove the filter for a moment um, or the background. Uh okay. So oh, you can kind of kind of sort of see her over in the corner. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, that's just her. That's this. That's the, that's the Twitch there. content people are here for, just to see our our pets. Yeah. So well, yeah. I mean, it's not for us. I can, <laughs> I can assure you that. But yeah, oh, this yeah. is a oh, this yeah, is a is. dark Sumatra mm. Takengan. I don't know. Sarate. But uh, it's it's a really this. really nice dark roast. It's Sumatran origin beans are organic, and just phenomenal. They're actually out of Milwaukee. The roaster is oh. um, not the beans, obviously. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but the roaster is, and and I have to say, I'm a huge fan. Uh, nice. This is uh, this is quite nice, and I, those. I just received those. I think it was Saturday. It must have been okay. Saturday because I, I held them in reserve ready. Uh, and and it's it's a hit. I'm here to tell you that's a really good coffee. So if you get a chance, I'm, I'm a big dark roast fan. Yes. Um, I, I realize, and, and most people don't, uh, so I love to pull out this trivia, but somebody beat me to it. Michael did this morning on, on Twitter. Uh, light roast is actually higher caffeine, higher in mm -hmm. caffeine. Uh, however, and as much as that inspires me to go, oh, I need to get the light roast, I actually much, much, much prefer the flavor of a good dark roast. So what I wind up doing to compensate is just drink more coffee. So I consider right. that a win, right. actually. Yes, exactly. I don't consider that a huge sacrifice. I consider that a good thing. But but yeah, it's uh it's it's quite a nice uh nice flavor profile. And uh yeah, I'm I'm a happy camper. So what what are you drinking, Nate? Well, I, I'm a, a blue bottle fan and I've oh, yeah. been a subscriber yeah, yeah. to their various espressos. Quite a while i'd actually have to look to see how many years i've been doing that and I've, i think i've tried just about everybody at this point and believe me i i love almost all of it i don't think i've found too many that i'm like oop, gonna kick that to the curb every so often i, I actually i shouldn't say that i did did get some stuff earlier well i guess this was last year that i wasn't super enamored with um you know which is kind of rare but yeah opuscope is my probably my favorite of of the blue bottle stock mm. espresso blends so that that's what i've been rocking for Quite a number of months now I just kind of got in that habit but i go back and forth between the just send me what you feel like roasting versus no no just give me the opiscope and i probably need to turn <laughs> on the yeah go ahead you just throw me something every couple of weeks and i'll i'll drink it again just to get but some you, variety 
you know, that's the problem. And I, I talk about this to anybody who listens. So, and, and I'm here to listen, you're stuck, you're stuck. So, uh, but it's, it's sort of like the, why don't you venture out more and try different restaurants or different dishes at restaurants you go to. And, and it, it always comes down to when you, if you're going out for like a special evening out or a different evening out, just kind of like, Hey, it's Thursday, let's go out. Uh, you're probably far more likely to try something different. Mm -hmm. However, if you're just like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't feel like, you know, cooking anything, let's just go grab something. So what do you do? Do you try something that may be really good? It may be a new favorite or right. maybe absolutely like, uh, you know, right. that was a huge disappointment. Or do you go with something, you know, that's going to bring you pleasure. Right. And 99% of the time, if it's not like a special, let's, let's go out and do something different type of experience, you're going to choose what's comfortable. You're going to choose what is a known quantity that you really, really appreciate that, you know, you love. Yeah. And that goes back to the coffee too. It's like, right, well, okay, right. I get up every morning. I want something that I know I can count on that I know is going to be just phenomenal. So most of the time you go to your, your old standbys, your favorites that you've you've chosen over years of testing, right? <laughs> well, and, and, and I'm, I'm an espresso right. guy, right? So I'm, yeah. I'm pulling shots every morning. And uh, if yeah, anybody yeah. who's done the full on home espresso experience knows getting the grind dialed in with the right size and the right amount of grounds and everything. Yep. So you got the right pressure and the right extraction. There's some tweaking there. And right. the, the downside of trying new things is you've got to go through a full, you know, a couple of shots before you get everything tweaked right. And when you're oh, pouring a couple. a couple of those Come down on. the drain, you're like, <laughs> I know how expensive this is. Oh. You know, and then you get a little, a little, a little grumpy, which, which yeah. happens to me. And not a good thing to be happening in the morning before you right. had before your espresso coffee, yeah. <laughs> and you're fighting with your grinder, you know? So, so there you go. And, and see, I like, I, I, I'm probably weird, but I like, I don't think there's a way you can prepare coffee that I don't like. I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, I'm very utilitarian and practical when it comes to like morning coffee. It's like drip. That's fine. It's sure. perfectly fine. However, uh, then, then there comes the time for, I feel like making an espresso. I feel like breaking out the AeroPress or the mocha pot or the French press or whatever, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, I'm trying to, the, yeah, I guess the uh, ceramic cone uh, pour over and stuff like that, that I just... I, I don't know it, but, but anyway, getting back to the, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting distracted and thinking about coffee, like, uh, but, but each one of those requires a different set of tweaks. So if you change your coffee, uh, let's say the mocha pot, you're going to change the amounts. You're going right. to change, you know, how long you let it go before you pull it off. Uh, you know, everything changes ever so slightly. So once you kind of get a particular coffee dialed in, it is hard to kind of, you know, get off that dime and, and try something different. Uh, again, unless you're like, hey, I'm kind of feeling experimental. I want to do something different today. And then it's like, eh, what, what the heck? Let me grab this one. Right. We'll try this. Right. So, anyway. Well, we've got Mary hanging out with us. She says hi. So hi, Mary. Good to see you. Mary. Glad you're joining us. Pleasure. You know, I, it, it's cold for her, too. She, you know, she's here in our Midwest <laughs> area where the temperatures have been chilly. I, I feel very bad for our friends in Texas, for sure. I, I know having talked with Paul last week, I know it was a yeah. pretty miserable week down there. I'm glad they're finally, hopefully, on the right side of that modulo, the uh, boil your water issues and uh sweet color nine says i don't drink coffee Pfft, morning workouts in my coffee <laughs> oh yeah we'll we'll, well talk about this we'll talk about this later awesome for you and sad mm -hmm. as well so you know <laughs> and and there's there's nothing that says you can't have a cup of coffee and work out i mean that's one of the things i love about riding bikes you ride to the coffee shop you have yourself an espresso and you ride home i mean that's that's good living right there Hey, I do arm curls all the time. Just, you just know, one of these. One at a time, just yeah, again and again. Yeah, that's that's why you've got that yep. massive upper right arm and yeah, that's a good one. So <laughs> yeah, Mary, I'm we're feeling the same thing. Mark, it finally must have warmed up for you. We're we're finally above zero. Minnesota was locked in the ninety five hours below zero joy that is the polar vortex. Yeah. And it's snow is now melting again, which makes me very happy because I'm not a big snow fan. I'm I'm ready for spring. You yeah, know. the last couple of days it it has cracked uh, cracked freezing, and now right now it, my watch says it's forty five degrees outside Fahrenheit. Of course, oh my gosh, um, yeah. So it's just tropical heat wave, and I think right. it's supposed to get up in the fifties tomorrow, oh. and then just kind of drop down to the forties for highs for a couple of days, and then back down. Yeah, I mean it's it's not spring yet, but it's no, at no. least at least okay, you know. Right. I I really do feel for the Texans because I was mentioning to someone that I think it was when we were like high of seven and low of minus three or something, which we got down to where the highs were, you know, zero 
uh, here. Our highs were is, below zero, friend. Right. But I mean, this is St. Louis. Uh, area, yeah. So this is much further south. Generally speaking, you can figure out about nine degrees warmer than Chicago, just, sure. just as a ballpark, you know, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, North Texas and, and quite a ways into Texas, they had the same temps we did. Right. So I think people don't realize how unprecedented that really was. It's not like it, it got cold in Texas. It got unusually cold. It got freaking insanely cold because right. for here, we don't often get down to highs of zero. And they were sitting around highs of zero in places in Texas. That is unheard of, it, unprecedented in the history, I think, of, of recorded temps in Texas. So it, yeah. it was a little more than unusual. It was crazy, just insane. So um, yeah, I, I again, I, one of the, the folks I watch on YouTube, he was talking about he uh, you know, they lost power. He left, took his family, came back and a water pipe had, had burst. Oh, that's the worst. So flooded their house, you know, so they're looking at cutting, I think the, the bottom 12 to 18 inches of, of drywall and, and walls and everything, clearing everything out, drying it out, replacing throughout the entire house. So, I mean, this is crazy stuff, but again, um, who would think in Texas where a low is something like, I don't know, 40, let's say in the right. wintertime that that the high would be 40 degrees below that i mean that's right. just nuts for a daytime high so um it's it's horrible it's sad you have a lot of people who are terribly affected but uh but yeah you because my first thought I, i'll admit my first thought is well you know texans they should you know be prepared why don't they even have like a little kerosene heater or propane heater or something it's like oh yeah because it never gets that they cold. don't need them <laughs> or or they yeah. have one but they well, haven't they... needed it in a decade and you know it's in the garage somewhere we're not exactly yeah. sure where or that yeah. would be sort of like you and i having hurricane preparedness type right. stuff you know plywood right. to board up the windows it's like we don't get hurricanes here, exactly. nor will we ever get hurricanes here. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, I, uh, a guy I used to work with would have a, uh, in his, his email signature line, a, 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 an old proverb, uh, man plans, God laughs. And <laughs> I've never forgotten that because yeah. it struck me as hilarious at the time. And it's like, yep, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, the, the universe just looks at it and goes, oh, you think so? You think you got this? Hold my right. beer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a good point. You bring up sort of the longer term ramifications and you know, it's bad enough when you've got to throw out food in your fridge if you have a power outage. But if you've got six, 10 inches of water in your house, yeah. I mean, that's going to take months for some people to get that fixed and rectified. And with everybody and, you know, sort of work from home, learn from home mode. Yep. Boy, that's going to be a real catastrophe for a lot of folks. You know, I, I feel sorry for any of our, our friends and neighbors there in Texas. Hope everybody gets safe here and healthy yeah. quick. But yeah. Just what we needed. You know, I, I, 2020 taught me to never say, well, it can't get any worse. You know, <laughs> yeah, here we I are, think this is... tail end of a pandemic. And, uh, you know, let's throw some biblical proportions of cold weather. What, you know, hey, let's have a, a an engine nearly fall off an airplane, right? I mean. Right. Oh, did you see the, uh, the Craigslist ad for that? Actually, the cowling? No. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Uh, I, I think I saved that. Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, for sale, Boeing 777 right engine cowlip used $9,999. Uh, for sale, one slightly used B777 right engine cow leading edge lip. Uh, used in average condition, needs some cosmetic repairs, PayPal cosmetic or Venmo repairs. only, no checks, no low ballers. I know what I have. Nice. <laughs> That, I mean, oh, can I you imagine something like that yeah. falling out of the sky? You're just kind of hanging out uh, near your house and like you hear this thump and you look out and you're like, I think that's part of an engine. Did you notice the truck that was parked there that, that just got thrashed? Yeah. Looked, yeah. That's, that's like good it times, landed, isn't it? Right. It looked like it landed right, right on the truck and then bounced and rolled off. Oh, so let me see gosh. if I can. Come on. Once again, I got it. Once again, 2021 says, say 2020, leave it to me. I'm on it. I'm right. on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just think you're done with the fun. That's oh, right. No. Well, Mary Mark says you're the true spring advocate. And I'm not sure if she means spring the framework or spring the season. I guess we'd, we'd maybe need further <laughs> clarification. Well, I think it must be the season because I am so ready for warmer weather. Oh, God. <laughs> Although I do appreciate the other context as well. Absolutely. Uh, you know. But uh, but yeah, I, after after crazy temps like this, it's just like, I don't know. What are we doing, Nate? I don't know. What are we doing? Well, I, I mean, I, in, until we move the whole team to Hawaii, I guess this is what we're stuck with. So, a, a former colleague of ours one, one, well, frequently said, "Snow is not a bug; it's a feature." But I, I don't, I don't know. After a point, I think it might be a bug. Too much of a good thing. So, I, I mean, I, I have several friends that live in California, and they remind me that you can drive to the snow. 
and then you drive home. And and <laughs> right. I, I got to tell you, there's a lot to like about that. Sure. Yeah. There, yeah. There's there's thought. I I have thought long and hard about you know is there is there a better place to to reside than than the Midwest? And I, I guess the counter is it's so lovely here in the summer. Yeah, you know, I actually love spring and fall more so than summer. Sure. Uh, summer's nice, but I mean, it can get pretty. Well, I you're probably not as humid there, but but St. Louis can get oppressively we, humid. We get the humidity, just not the frequency that that you do. You know, so we'll oh, get the 90s, we'll get the dew points in the the tropical zone, but generally it's not. Well, like in Atlanta, you know, there, there's a reason they call it hot Atlanta, right? I mean, you, you've mm -hmm. got that 90 degrees, you know, from seemingly, <laughs> you know, the the late April, early May until October. You know, we don't have that solid a block of of right. 90s, but you know, we generally have quite a number of days over 90, but. Well, you depends. have what six six or seven days of summer? Is that? Uh... It depends on the year. Some days we get we get into the low <laughs> double digits, you know. Okay. And, and what's really fun is I've noticed a lot in the last few years we just skip spring. You know, we yeah. we go immediately from you know temps in the twenties, thirties, and snow to temps in the seventies. And then what's really fun is then a week or two later, then it snows again. Which it's like, wait, what just happened? That's exactly what I was going to say. It seems like we don't necessarily skip it so much as as we skip back and forth over it. Uh -huh. Because yeah. the last couple of three years, it seems like it'll get really warm and you're thinking, wow, that was fast. And then, yeah, back to snow or ice or some crazy. And, and then, every, you know, the birds <laughs> fly north, fly south, fly north. Right. <laughs> just, like, what's, what's going on? on? We're really confused here. <laughs> and, and you're thinking at some point this will settle out. And then it does, you know, at about 102 degrees, yeah. you know, in, oh, in May, you know, mm -hmm. you're thinking, oh, my gosh, what the heck? Is this going to be a terrible year? We're going to be in the, the hundreds all through. And then, of course, it moderates out to where it's like just mildly miserable. But anyway, yeah, it's uh, just crazy. So yeah, there, yeah. there are a single digit number of days where I think, boy, having an outdoor job would be pretty sweet. And then the rest of it, I'm like, nah, I like being an indoor cat. I like being a house cat. That that doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. So I, I always think back to the Mark Twain quote about everybody always talks about the weather, but no one does anything about it. Right. So, right. I mean, what's up know, with that? What's up with get that? on that. <laughs> well, I suppose we should talk some tech. Uh, you know, I mean, Mary's okay. talked about spring. Let's let's circle back to spring. So I think. Oh, thanks, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, <laughs> keeping us on task here. Like. <sighs> I mean, isn't this why people tune in to hear Mark and I talk about the kids these days and get off my lawn? I mean, I don't know. But <laughs> coffee and airplane exactly. parts falling from the sky exactly. and crazy exactly. Texas. Well, heat. I mean, we we can't talk about you know horrible travel experiences because it's basically been a year since we've been on airplanes. You know, I'm pretty sure it's a year since my last trip at this point. And you know, so I don't have any of that to complain about. We just have to, you know, maybe I don't know. Are you looking forward to traveling again? I mean, I, I think it's going to happen. I don't know if it's 2021 or not, but you know, what do you I, think? I, I, I'm an incurable optimist, but also, you know, seasoned with a bit of pragmatism, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that um, when, when, you know, in the before times, uh, it was, it was very easy and not uh, to, to not even think about anything, just to go, oh, I need to present here. Or I need to be there and just book and go. Uh, and, I, and I don't necessarily think that's entirely a bad thing because, I mean, you can be more responsive if you just like act, don't necessarily have to think through everything to the nth degree. However, uh, the the ecological impact um, was significant, shall we say. And there were there were times, I mean, let's face it, we could have gotten by you know, the old joke, you know, this could have been an email. This meeting could have been an right. email. There, there are times that we really could have done things virtually. However, it just wasn't maybe as convenient or acceptable, or it was a lot harder to pull the group together to do, you know, the, whoever was involved and so many other things. So, so I think, yes, at some point we will go back to traveling. I don't think it will return to the point that it was because I think that people, you know, the technology has gotten better and, yeah. and I, I realize it's only been a year and a half, you know, but, but as with a lot of use and a lot of more, a lot more use cases and a lot more, uh, attention and focus and and we need to have this because we don't have any other options in in certain cases uh, that there's there's been a lot more acceptability and acceptance and just better experience yeah. uh, i I think that we are getting better in our field at not taking the physical experience and trying to duplicate it online, which is right. just not workable in in many cases. Some things obviously transfer one to one, but very few. Uh, so they either need tweaked or replaced with an alternative. And and we're getting better at that. Uh, witness uh, DevNexus. I, yeah. I, you took part last week. Mm -hmm. I took part. And I was 
I was incredibly impressed with the the way everything worked and it works yes. well. And, and, and I mean, we've had some great experience. The spring one last year was awesome. Yep. Uh, and there've been a couple others that I can't uh, re remember off the top of my head that I've walked away going, that was, that was pretty good. I mean, we're making some good strides, but I think the experience just keeps getting polished and smoother and, right. and more, more flexible and, and um, capable. So I think there will never, just like meetings, there, there are always times that you're going to, the, the most efficient way forward is to sit down and face somebody Right. Uh, in, in real time, in real life. Uh, but there are many times that a, a virtual gathering a meeting of some kind can work. And I think we'll get better about choosing those and selecting those and fitting those in the right circumstances. So I, I do think that at some point we're going to go back to traveling, but it's not going to be the frenetic pace. I mean, there were times uh, in the last few years that literally, I, I think I look back, what was it? Um, beginning of December, and I look back over the previous 90 days, I'd been home six days. Yeah. And, and, and that's crazy. To th I mean, at the right. time, it's just like, look, I've got to get from here to there. I've got to do this. It's right. just the way the schedule fell, right? It wasn't like it was anybody's fault. I was just trying to be here and I could make it work. And I did. Right. But that's nuts. When you look at it after the fact, you look at it, you're like, that's just kind of crazy. How, how, how much less effective, how much less productive, how much less whole as a human being are you when you do that stuff? And, and that's not a, a, an, an aberration that, that 90 days was just kind of when I looked and, and started right, kind of adding right. it up and went, holy cow, it's, it's amazing. My wife still puts up with me. <laughs> well, so. I, it, it did make me wonder maybe for our, our respective spouses, this was actually a feature, not a bug that we went home very much. <laughs> you know, I think we, we shouldn't discount that possibility to be fair, but no, I, I know what you mean. I, I definitely have some of those apps as well. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me at one point, I, I should not have done this, but I did the math and one year i think i was well over 400 hours in the air and that's just time in the air and then i i did the math of number of times on airplanes over however many days that was from when i started flying to the, my last flight of the year and i i think i was averaging a flight like every 32 hours or some crazy thing now granted some of that was a two hop into europe you know where i fly into amsterdam sure. and then from amsterdam somewhere else but still, it, it, it was kind of a crazy number of, of trips that we would sometimes take. Now, I miss the in-person side of it. You know, there's definitely yeah, the bit yeah. of engagement that, that we can't get. But by the yes. same token, what we're doing right now, no one would put you and I on a stage and let us talk for an hour and assume people would show up. Like, so to your, to your <laughs> right. point, it's given us some of these opportunities. And, you know, you mentioned DevNexus. I was a little apprehensive about the, you want me to record my talk beforehand? But then it's so much fun to be able to interact with your audience while the <laughs> talk is going on. It's, I know. It's cool. It's like I'm playing devil's advocate with myself, you know, and it was great. Yeah, and it's it's weird because when they first threw that out there, I thought it seems like the worst of both worlds. Right? Yes. You're, you're having to record a talk in advance and 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 edit out the uhs because at least you can, you know, but it's not that dynamic live. So, you know, when you pause and go, uh, you, and then you realize later, you're like, well, I got, I got to clip that out. That's terrible. Um, so you're, you're having to do more work in that regard, right. but then you have to show up at the record at the, right. at the broadcast time too. And it's like, so you don't get any of the benefits of that, but you get all the, the downsides, right? Well, actually it works out incredibly well when you yes. go and same thing, you're like, man, I can feel these, these questions in the comments versus, you know, realizing there are questions there right before they cut you off. No, not dev nexus, but any other events. And, and you, you wrap up and you're just barely into the wire and you go, say, well, let me see if there are any questions. You see there are like eight or 10 questions and right. you want to, you start to answer and then they close the room. Right. And then all the questions that people wanted to ask and the, that you wanted to answer just disappear. And you're thinking, ah, oh, crud, you know, yeah. how do I, how do I fix that experience? Uh, so yeah, Dev Nexus, I really feel like kind of nailed it. It was just, just wonderful. So the only thing I would, would ask is that there were, there were 30 minute sessions and, and man, I just about can't uh, clear my throat in 30 minutes. So I, yeah, I feel it's like tough. it's like, well, if, if we had 45, uh, that would be awesome. But you know, the, it, it's hard to, to argue a success and it really did go smoothly. So yeah, eh. I, I agree. That, that was my experience as well. I was very pleasantly surprised at how much, how enjoyable it actually was to be able to have some of that interaction and yet still the talks going on and, and I get to be on that, that side at the same time. So, you know, hats off to Pratik and Vincent and crew for, for pulling off a great event again. You know, now that said, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful 2022 will be back in Atlanta. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Yeah. You know, there are, there are just a very small handful of events that you look at and you go, 
I don't ever want to miss them. I really yeah. don't. And Dev Nexus is one of those. I, I feel like we're giving them a lot of, of <laughs> free advertising, but but they are consistently awesome. You know, I've yeah. never gone and and gone to Dev Nexus and and walked away and gone, wow, what a, what a disappointment. It's every time it's like, how do they keep yeah. one upping themselves year after year after year? It's just when you think there's no way they're going to top this. You come back the next year, you, you just say the same thing when you're leaving. It's like, there's no way they're going to top this next year. Right, right. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the other instant thing you bring up, and we certainly saw this with Spring One, is by doing these events virtually, it radically increases your audience size in terms of who yeah. can attend. And it isn't just the people who can afford to come to this location or who can get the time off work. You know, f most people can kind of finagle. Now, now, of course, the other side is it's a lot harder to get people to block out a day or two. You know, sure. it's very easy to get slurped back into the work or, you know, your real life. Oh, you know, yeah. you got to go teach your kid algebra or or deal with, you know, some, well, <laughs> your house is flooded, uh, you know, et cetera, kind of things. <laughs> right. You know, so it's very easy to get slurped back into the real world. But, you know, we certainly saw that with Spring One that it was able to to go global and bring in people who for whom the travel costs were, were a barrier of entry. And and I oh, do yeah. think that's and we've seen that with with the jugs as well, where now it isn't just a jug in this city and only people in this city are attending. You can really say, you know, I'd really like I see who's presenting at, uh, you know, insert your favorite user group here. I can attend this month because it's just a link instead of me getting on an airplane or oh, I don't live in that city. So obviously I can't go. Right. Yeah. It makes a big difference. Again, pros and cons, right. but I do think we're gaining more than we're losing by mm -hmm. doing this. I just, uh, you know, we humans are very, we have very short memories. Yes, uh, we do. So I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we can come out the other end of this and not immediately lose our brains and go, well, okay, now that we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and then, and then go back and remake some mistakes. I'm hoping we can take the best of both worlds. And I think yeah. we will. I think there'll be enough people who will go, uh, you know, I mean, let's do this one virtually. Let's sure. let's have the one big showcase event if we want to physically where we get people. Cause, cause I mean, there is no real substitute for that hallway track for the in-person meetings, the catching somebody after a talk and just kind of brainstorming with them. However, there are, there's no substitute for that, but there are alternatives to that, that the online experience gives that you cannot get uh, in the physical world and, right. and, and to be able to take that multi-pronged approach and do the best of all worlds, I think is, is the, the big win. So yeah. again, yeah. hopefully we'll remember the lessons we learn and, and take them to heart. So, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, to your point, I, I think <clears throat> what'll be fascinating is to see what does the new normal look like a year mm -hmm. from now when, you know, hopefully most people are vaccinated and, and we started to actually hang out with other human beings and, and do more normal <laughs> things. You know, I mean, I think about this in terms of like work from home, you know, we're at a point now where I think my wife has been work from home for almost a full year. Now, I mean, for you and I, this has been normal for quite a while. So it's not as big of a change for us. But I just think about how many individuals went from, well, no, we have to have everybody in the office. And these are our core hours to, Yeah, you know, if you just want to work from home forever, go ahead. And then so I'm really curious to see, frankly, what the office looks like, you know, in a year or two, you know, is, is it, I don't think it's going to be what it was before. No. And, and what's interesting is I, I don't know where you fall on open floor plans and, and, <laughs> you know, don't care because I know I'm right on this. Uh, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I mean, I haven't run into anybody who will advocate for open floor plans for very long after they've right. lived, lived that dream. Uh, because while they do offer advantages, you know, even for the people who are, are, you know, living in them. Uh, the primary advantage to open floor plans is that it costs less for the company to, to put in and to, to maintain, you know, literally you have no walls, you have a few posts that are load bearing and you throw in desks and you say, Hey, it's good for collaboration. Uh, right. what, what always struck me is interesting is that in every open floor plan area, there are always quiet rooms and conference rooms. Right. And, and it's like, well, if it's good for collaboration and not having walls, why do we have any? Why do the executives have wall offices right. with wall? How do we, you know, I mean, there's several things you look at and you, that point out very clearly and obviously the fallacy of that. However, um, I, I mean, I do think there's there is an element of collaboration. Please don't get me wrong. I mean, there there are certain again, it's that that you know you take a few benefits and you go, well, yeah, but they cost less, so we're going to amplify those and forget the rest, uh, forget the downsides. But I do think we're going to have a lot more. Um, focus on, on healthy distancing and, yes. uh, you know, where it's not like 5,000 people in a Petri dish, you have, you know, 
uh, 1500 people in, in an area that, that is more broken up for right. airflow. Maybe you don't have, you know, individual offices with doors and all this crazy stuff, uh, for, for everybody who comes in as a, you know, uh, you know, Hey, I'm first day out of uni and I'm, I'm going to sit down in my own private office at the door and no windows and nobody's going to see me again. But I do think it's going to be, again, you know, they, the old saying, you know, the, the pendulum has to swing all the way to the, to one side before it can yes. come back to the middle. And I think we're going to see, I hope we're going to see, some more sane and rational thought, placing workers' health and 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 you know uh, mental health and and physical health uh, at more of a forefront than perhaps has been in the case in certain instances before. We'll see. You know, again, I'm an optimist, but I also am a realist. <laughs> and you know, what I think we'll look at at certain uh, certain companies that you know uh, aren't aren't necessarily known for their privacy rights. Right. They've heavily espoused uh, open floor plans, and we'll see what they do, and we'll. That'll probably be a really good barometer, at least on the, you know, the extreme. So, well, o- open floor plans are a great way of selling noise canceling headphones. That's yeah. that's one thing I've noticed. <laughs> right. You know, the right. the other thing is there's pretty strong data that when companies move to an open office plan, collaboration kind of decreases in the sense that yes. people are afraid yes. to go interrupt anybody, and so everybody now goes back to messaging, even though I'm messaging someone who's sitting you know, right next to me or two doors down, because if I start chatting with you, then I'm bothering you. And, and you know, it, it, to your point, I remember one local company here in the Twin Cities that very infamously said, you know, nobody has an office anymore. Well, except the senior executives all had space near their cubes where they could go to have meetings, you know, so in other words, they had an office, we just called it a conference room instead of an office. It's like, but it's hmm. a special conference room that only they're Correct. allowed to go into. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's amazingly enough, not one you can book. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how that works. But it is tough, you know, and again, I, I hate to hammer on the balance thing. But there was, I, I know, probably everybody has this story from the time that they worked in an office, but there's always that one person who I, I'll never forget this one gentleman I worked with, and and he was a, uh, let's just say a consultant, uh, who would who would come over, and uh, would would you know of course everybody's desk area would typically have an extra chair sitting there and stuff again to foster collaboration right, right. it wasn't it wasn't a separate office but you know kind of a small groupings you know uh, but he'd come in plop down and go I'm bored, and you know what that meant yeah, let me interpret that for you entertain me for the next two hours yes so whatever you had on your your agenda to do like legit deadlines you had to work on you had to try to work on Pause and that, please <laughs> he didn't get the hint and he was a nice guy it's not right. like i didn't like him but and, and everybody liked him but but it's the same thing it's like you know it, it was oh it's my turn you know and, and i have a deadline i have to get done and then i've got to do this and i've got to get that out the door and and i'm sitting here trying to to figure out code and think and while he's talking to me and I'm trying to carry on a semi, you know, intelligent conversation. Uh, so, so collaboration can be a positive and it can be a negative. So. <laughs> right. Right. No, I, I know what you mean. And of course, even in those, those office spaces, you, you still have to deal with the person who would bring in the crunchiest food known to humankind. And of course we still get that on zoom calls. I mean, how, how often does that happen where someone unmutes themselves and then proceeds to eat? <laughs> you know, cereal. That that seems to be the goal. You know, and they're banging the spoon on the bowl, and it's like, ah, cool, cool. Are are you hint? I feel I feel seen. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it may have come up on some of the Zoom calls you and I've been on. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's possible. It's possible. I, I I'm gonna go on a limb and say that one's pretty universal, though. I think I think everybody's run into that at some point. Oh yeah, so. yeah. Yes. You know, Tasha, I mean, Tasha we're... agrees with the bowl scrape. Uh, so yeah, it's <laughs> it, it it is the scrape. That's the annoying part. You know. The, <laughs> The crunching you can kind of tune out but the... oh. well although i get it from my coworkers, to... my my yeah. cohabitants here <laughs> my wife made that comment to me she said you eat yogurt really loud like oh i don't want to leave any in there right i just i just got a glare <laughs> from the stairs so apparently she's paying it's, attention that, that's the other thing is you never cup. quite know when your your cohabitants are listening to your conversations <laughs> Oh, but well, you find out later. So, yeah. well, yeah, I'll definitely find out later. <laughs> anyway, so um, this is actually a question I don't know if I know the answer to. How did you get involved with Spring? I you know we we refer to you as a Spring advocate, but you weren't <laughs> always a Spring advocate. So how did how did that come into being? Uh, no, you know, I uh, I I had I poked Spring with a stick. Had 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 done a little bit of work with it on a couple of projects in in. And way before times, 
Uh, but but by and large, I did uh, when I did server side Java, it was Java E, oh, yeah. and I I did a lot of of work with uh, with Java E as well as some client stuff uh, as well, which I. Interestingly enough, even when I started doing a lot more Java E and publishing a lot more stuff on it, still some of my articles that were written on like Java FX got the the most views. I, I, and I always kind of attributed that to because it was a smaller number of of articles being published sure. and posts, you know, being generated and stuff that that I poured a lot into, you know. I, and I did the same level of attention, but it, you know, when you have, I guess, a smaller chorus of voices, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, but no, I did I did a lot more Java E and. Um, I was I was actually a, a Java evangelist. I'd moved into uh, evangelism at Oracle uh, because I, I I often tell people that that a lot of times advocacy is kind of an accidental profession, right? Uh, because it's not like most people go I they they go to university and they go I want to be an advocate. They they go I want to be a developer. I want to be whatever you know. Um, so you wind up doing let's say in this case, development work. And, and, you know, I'm writing code and I'm doing this and I'm finding things and I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. I, I worked through this and found this weird, um, weird, I started to say <laughs> confluence of things, but I didn't want to, you know, anyway, uh, <laughs> this weird combined set of circumstances that lead to this outcome and you go, oh, I can fix that. I can address that. That's, it's not a bug, but it's this weird quirk in, in how you put something together. So, so you write it up and you share it or you, you tell your, your colleague next to you about it and they go, that's kind of cool. You should have a departmental level like lunch brown bag type thing. So you do that. And, and then somebody's at the brown bag and they go, that was really cool. You know, I go to the local Java user group all the time. Why don't you come and present that here in a month or two? Uh, would you mind? Sure. That's fine. So they put you in touch with the jug leader and you, you go and you present. And then at some point you either uh, throw something out to a conference or somebody reaches out to you and says, Hey, I saw you at the, the local meeting. We have this conference we're spinning up. We'd like you to present. And you go, Oh, Okay. And then, you know, the next thing you know is somebody else says, hey, would you go and present in Sweden or what, you know, and that's, that was kind of my progression is uh, I wound up doing a, a Java one and then, and then J focus in Sweden. And then from there, it just went crazy. Well, all this stuff is on the side, right? Right. Uh, so I'm working my normal, you know, normal hours, normal hours, uh, and then working crazy hours on top of to put together materials and, you know, sessions and recordings and, and abstracts and all this stuff. Uh, and, and somebody, uh, a, a, a gentleman who became a really good friend of mine at Oracle said, Hey, how would you like to make this your full-time job? So you're not having to kill yourself and work hundred plus hour weeks. And, and little did I know that that doesn't really change the number of hours you work. <laughs> I wind I, and I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. I, I still put in crazy hours because I, I, I'm a curious sort. I like to kind of pull at a thread and keep pulling. And, and once I get started pulling, it's like, you know, I, I don't want to stop. So I, I tend to work a lot of hours by choice, admittedly, nobody's making me, but, but it, what it does change is the mix. So you're not doing like eight to 10 hours of work, work, and then going home and doing extra work. Right. You're just mixing these. So you're doing like a blog post and you're doing a recording and you, then you're doing some coding and then you're, then you're going back and doing some, you know, writing up an abstract after dinner or something. And so it's, um, it's just kind of weird, uh, weird thing. So, so anyway, I, 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 did a lot of Java E stuff. And then when Oracle in their infinite wisdom decided they didn't need Java evangelists, they cut us all loose. Uh, yeah, and, and, um, and, and it was just kind of a, a I think a timing thing that, uh, that good folks at Pivotal reached out to, to some of us and said, Hey, you know, uh, what do you think? And uh, I was, was eager to, I, I don't, I don't like being idle. So when, when they let us go, my first thought was, what am I going to do with my time? <laughs> I just, you know, I, I know there are other concerns and, you know, it's not like I wasn't concerned about eating, but, but what I really was concerned with is what am I going to do? I'm just going to, I'm going to be one of these people who walks around aimlessly and just is horribly depressed because I don't know what I'm going to do next. And, and, well, um, and more importantly, where am I going to get all my t-shirts? Well, there is that too. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I started talking with, uh, with Andrew here and at, here, there at Pivotal, you know, obviously some, several things have changed in the iterations. Uh, but it sounded really intriguing because uh, very much the, hey, you know, we know you're an adult. We know what you're, you, 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 we know that you know what needs to be done. If you need a course correction, I will let you know, right. go make magic happen. Uh, and, and we're going to give you the tools to do that. And, and so many tools, the spring ecosystem uh, in the, in, since the time and, and the scope that I had, had done anything with it, which again was terribly limited and terribly old, had changed dramatically. I mean, this was, 
before Spring Boot. And, and now, of course, when I came on, Spring Boot had just gone GA. Uh, and, and of course, you had Spring Cloud and the various different uh, projects within that and, and Spring Cloud at the time. Uh, I guess I'm trying to think XD. Uh, Spring Data uh, XD. I remember any of the words even because it's the the terms because it's changed a couple of, of times since. Uh, Spring Cloud Stream. You've got all kinds of great great stuff uh, that uh, and 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 the other thing that really appealed to me was Cloud Foundry, which I know is kind of anachronistic to talk about, but the developer experience. Uh, I'm I'm really I, I uh, nope just cancel that call. Uh, sorry, kid call. Um, I'll call her back. <laughs> I promise. But uh, why isn't but she the watching you live? I know, I know. From the developer perspective, we take on a lot of stuff, not because we want to, but because we we feel like we have to or need to. So, so in many cases, we we embrace complexity only because we have been locked in to the point that it hurt us before. Right. So, so you tend to, and this is a human condition, right? It's not unique to developers, but we, we go, Oh, I, I hit this wall before and I couldn't get around it and I couldn't get any, you know, there was no lever to pull. There was no help to request. Uh, no one threw me a lifeline because there was no lifeline. Uh, so I'm not going to let that happen to me again. I'm going to take on all these things so I can do whatever I need to do when I need to do it. Uh, which leads us to overly complex solutions in many cases. Uh, Cloud Foundry was simple elegance in in the from the developer slash user perspective in that you could deploy applications, scale them, uh, set up uh, you know routing. So many things that were so much simpler to do. And from a developer perspective, is like you mean that lets me concentrate on the the actual things I need to do. Right. Uh, and and so between the Spring ecosystem and and the platform basically saying it's for you. You know, we're, we're doing this, we're, we're setting this up to make your life better, which again, makes the business better. Uh, it was compelling. Uh, and I, I did talk to other folks. There were several other things that were kind of in the works, but I, how can you beat that combination? Right. Uh, and and um, uh, when I came on, Andrew basically said, you've got, uh, take, take some time, just kind of start examining and playing with different things and see what you, what you really want to focus on. And, and I always tell people, you know, I took, you know, let's say 30 days, uh, you, you have 30 days to go through the candy store and try every piece of candy in the candy store. So you go through the candy store and, you know, at the end of 30 days, go, wow, that was delicious. That you, So many things. And I've got these top 15 in the, and then somebody points out to you that, oh, that's just the main room. You, you see all those doors around the periphery? Right. Those open into other candy shops. Right. And you start realizing the, the breadth and depth of the ecosystem. And it's just incredible. So that's kind of how I came to spring. I, um, and, and, I'm still in awe. You know, there are so many things that, uh, and even I, you know, everybody's a noob at something. Even the stuff you think you're an expert at, you're still probably a noob at because there are still things that you haven't discovered. And it's just crazy the things that every week there's some new discovery. I'm thinking, how did I overlook that for the last, I don't know, two years, five years, whatever. And and when did that when did that go in? Is that a new feature? Nope, it's been there. You know, it's been there for a long time now. Yeah. <laughs> so I love the the constant discovery. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whiskey bar in Paris that has that exact same sort of attribute of, oh, uh, oh there's more? <laughs> there's another room? Yeah, no. Wow. It's, it's, I, I completely understand your Can your I just sleep there. here? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like, you're going to have to kick me out of here. Sorry. I don't know what time you close, but just leave me the keys. Don't worry. Right. I'll, I'll, here, here's my credit card. Well, it's fine. Or I'll see you at opening time tomorrow. Right. That's fine. Exactly, exactly. What time do you open? Uh, but no, I, I think that's one of those, those things that, that gets overlooked in software just in general, there are so many bits and bobs. And, you know, I, I, I feel like with Java in particular, I've kind of grown up with Java. You know, I, I made this comment last week that I'm old enough to remember when Java in a nutshell was a really thin book. And the last <laughs> right. version I saw of it was, I don't know, 800 pages. And I thought, I don't think we can call it a nutshell book anymore. I mean, let's, let's that's just a big be nut. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like, that'll keep the squirrels happy all winter. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, Bring so your I, friends. I, exactly. I, I, I certainly appreciate the fact that I've been able to kind of gradually add those things on. But to your point, then you come into something like the Spring ecosystem, which has all these 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 magical things that you can enjoy and play around with and, and have value. That's part of the challenge of being in this industry, you know, and what what advice would you give people to on how to keep up, how to learn new things, how to how to play around with this stuff? Because yeah, that's certainly part of our job, right? And I think it's one of the coolest parts of our job is go play with it and then go teach it. You know, so how how do you what, what what advice would you give a younger you on on how to learn the new stuff? 
Uh, you know, I mean, there, I, I used to always say one of these, and I'm going to, to kind of, I'm going to give two conflicting or at least apparently conflicting sets of, of, of advice. One is to constantly, I mean, our industry, you're, you said the words keep up, give that up right now. You will never keep up because every day, I mean, even JavaScript, there, there are like how many new JavaScript frameworks released every day, really. Right. Um, so, so taking that and expanding that pa into areas that really matter, uh, whoa, whoa, <laughs> sorry. whoa, what do you got against <laughs> JavaScript? No. I'm kidding. I just That's had to say that in words. Case, I just had to say that in case critiques listening, uh, <laughs> or in case he watches this in the future, but no, I, I, I think that if you, if you hope to keep up, you will lose. Now that doesn't mean don't try. That doesn't right. mean give up. Uh, but I do think it's important to realize that that our industry, even one small slice, Java or or a particular library or or a particular approach to doing something, uh, can change so dramatically so quickly that you know it within a particular slice of knowledge you can't keep up. Right. So what I always tell people, you know, that's either incredibly exhilarating or it's incredibly frustrating. And it's up to you how you uh, approach that. So what I like to do is embrace the, uh, you know, you've heard the embrace the suck. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to embrace the, the exhilaration of it. I like to look at it as like, look, learn one new thing a day. And, and some days it's going to be really something tiny and small and insignificant, and some, or you think. Uh, and then some days it's going to be something huge. But if at the end of the year, you've learned one new thing a day, you've learned 365 new things that year, which puts you ahead of like 99% of the other developers, right. architects, whatever, you know, that are out there, because most people fall into this um, comfort zone and, and it's easy not to necessarily push yourself forward. Uh, but, but it also does one other thing, which is, or a couple other things. One is instead of just learning 365 things, what actually happens is they tend to snowball and they tend yes. to accumulate and build and then some are foundational. And so you wind up learning a lot more than you even realized or set out to learn as long as you're open to that. The other thing I would say is that kind of conflicting with that is that don't get caught up in shiny bullet syndrome or, or the, the latest thing. Don't be a magpie. Don't look for the shiny object and chase it. Um, and and I don't want to I don't want to pick on anybody, but but there are we have a tendency uh, to look for a a you know when a new tool comes out, uh, and let's go with the QVC analogy. So QVC comes out and they have a a ratchet wrench, and it's like that, that could be kind of kind of handy at times, right? I mean, there are certain times it's hard to to get in and turn a wrench in a tight corner, so that's awesome. So what you wind up doing is you you grab this ratchet wrench and get, and, and the natural tendency within our sphere is to go ratchet wrench good, everything that preceded it bad. This is the natural evolutionary replacement for everything that came before. Ignoring the fact that, of course, wrenches don't, you know, I mean, this is probably a bad example. Wrenches don't change a lot, really. But, but you know, a, a code line, you know, it, it always amazes me when somebody goes, this project is new, therefore it is better than this project, which right. was, was initially released 10 years ago. It's like, really, let's look at the commit logs. When was the last commit? Oh, yeah, there have been 32 today on that old project. And, and the last commit for the new project was 17 days ago. Right. Which is newer, which is fresher, which is more active, which is more viable. And, and that's, you know, crazy metrics. Um, but the other thing too, is that um, we, we have a tendency to think in exclusives. So this new yeah. wrench, you know, that's going to replace all the old wrenches. No, it's going to be exceedingly good at certain things. Hopefully, hopefully it's not a, well, and, and not even just replaces all of the wrenches, but replaces all of their tools. We oh, see sure. that a lot in this industry where, oh, well, now I got a new hammer. Yes. I don't need yep, anything yep. else. Yes. And the, there's an old saying to the man with the hammer, everything looks like a nail. Absolutely. Well, that's not entirely untrue. Um, so, you know, you, you have this new wrench, new hammer, new whatever. And, and the immediate assep, assumption is that all the other stuff goes out the window. Well, no, because certain tools are, will never be surpassed or may never be surpassed in terms of their usefulness for maybe a broad range of things, maybe mm -hmm. a very narrow range of things, but they're, they're, they're made specifically and honed over perhaps decades or or generations or hundreds of years to to do that particular thing. And the same thing goes with software: the viability, the the um, uh, the adaptability of it, and and how well it's crafted, how how relevant it is, has nothing to do with when the project's inception was. It has to do with your use case. And and again, 
I'm guilty too. We're all guilty. We'd love to have the, the one ring to rule them all. We just wave it around, flash it. Everything falls into place. Software works. It never goes down. Uh, it's super performant. It starts up in, you know, 20 milliseconds and it, it, it maximum throughput and, you know, super scalable, but, but <laughs> it, it probably never will happen that it, you check every box every time. So it, it makes sense to, again, keep thinking, you know, evaluate, learn, grow, uh, try different things, make sure you understand where they fit, but don't assume that, that X is going to replace Y for all things, or it may be even for anything, but if it does, sure, maybe there are certain use cases tailor-made for X that, you know, so. We, we uh, also anyway. tend to lose sight of the fact that the new is often unproven, unfinished, and buggy. And oh, you sure. know, we all think yeah. it's it's going to be simple and elegant and wonderful. And and I am fond of reminding people that there aren't too many places in our life where you truly want the bleeding edge solution. You know, <laughs> it, it, yeah. It, your There's... doctor, if you go to your doctor, the doctor's like, hey, I've never done this to anybody. Can I do it to you? You're probably going to be like, um, you know, hard pass, hard pass. <laughs> but yet, as software engineers, we're all so excited to let's put this in production. What could possibly go wrong? And we find out when production goes down. Right. And I mean, they're, they're, I, I'm, an, I, I'm a crazy hobbyist too. You know, I like to try un, untried and unproven software. But would I feel that production on a dot, you know, 0.4 beta release? Probably not. Um, you know, how many times have you flashed your phone to a beta software load before you go on an international trip? Right. right. I, I mean, maybe you do if you're going to be at home for a month or sure. a, maybe even a week. Sure. Uh, because you really want to try this new feature. That's fine. You know, sure. That's but but generally speaking, when you absolutely have to have something working reliably, you're not going to just go, eh, what the heck? What right. could possibly go wrong? Because the universe will show you what could possibly go wrong. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, well, I'm anyway. going to switch gears. Mary Mary says she's happy to have us talk about anything. So I am very curious. How did you get into flying airplanes as if being a passenger in an airplane wasn't enough? You're like, hold my latte. I want to learn <laughs> how that front left seat works. You know, please put me in the zeroth chair, not not even the first or second row. What what caused you to decide that flying an airplane would be a fun hobby? I just got really tired of nobody being willing to fly me places, Nate. Totally, totally. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, you know, from the time I was a little kid, I would always look up at, at airplanes going over and think, wow, that's just got to be so, so liberating, so exhilarating. So, uh, you know, the view's got to be great. Right. Uh, it just looks like it would be really cool and, and never really executed on it, you know, because, uh, you know, life gets busy, yeah. you know, and of course, when you're in college, you're broke. When you're first starting out, you're broke. Uh, you have kids, you're broke. Uh, our kids are older now. So my wife at some point, you know, a couple of years ago looked at me and said, yeah, I don't even remember what prompted it, but I think there was a, uh, I think there might've been a car show and, an, and a fly in at, at our local airport, which we have some really nice small general aviation airports around this. One is just amazing. It's class Delta, which you know gives you a control tower, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not like the uh, little background you have uncontrolled airspace. So you have uncontrolled, um, airports, which are sometimes referred to as pilot controlled. So you're radioing and you're letting people know your position and where you are and the pattern. And when, you know, if you're 10 miles out approaching from the Southeast or whatever, uh, at, at certain number of feet. So, so you do all this stuff, or you have like your towered airports and your class Delta airports will control, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, allow you into the airspace. They'll, they'll position you, tell you when you're cleared to land a certain runway, uh, and, and which one is the active runway. So then you take that, you know, whatever, uh, right downwind for whatever runway. Uh, and then you go on up. So you have a class Charlie airport, which are slightly larger, uh, and control spacing and things like that. Um, and then you have your class Bravo, which are the big airports and, and a big is relative, you know, it, uh, it's, it's based on traffic and volume and all this stuff. So, uh, St. Louis is a smaller airport, let's say compared to here, but they're both class Bravo airports, uh, Atlanta, Hartsfield, Jackson, also class Bravo. Really? So you have, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you have uh, class Bravo is the largest airport classification okay. in the U S. Um, so I, anyway, getting a little off topic, but anyway, so we went to this air show or a uh, fly in and, and car show, which is uh, kind of a nice thing. Uh, and, and it, we, we were so young this, then. Yeah, I know. But we chatted with this guy and my wife said, you know, you should take lessons because you've always wanted to, you've always wanted to fly. Just, just go take some lessons. Uh, so I did and was immediately hooked. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we, we fly, uh, we wound up 
and, and we bought an airplane. It's, it's not, you know, a lot of people think, oh my gosh, it must be crazy expensive. Well, it can be. I mean, it's like, right. like everything else, you can buy a cheap beater car. Or you can buy a crazy expensive car, probably more than most people's like retirement plans. It depends on what you want to put in it. Right. Um, and, and, you know, part of that too is, is, I mean, airplanes have to be annually inspected and verified and FAA certified and all this stuff, unless you buy an experimental or build an experimental. Uh, but you have certain things that, you know, it's not like, like, you know, like your dirt cheap beater car, but, but it certainly can be an economical, more economical thing. I, I look at folks who golf, uh, you know, and you, you can probably attest to this or your wife could, if you. These thinly veiled attacks on uh, me need to stop, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, all right, I'll, I'll keep it down. But you know, that's another hobby that can be very, Absolutely. I won't say inexpensive, but you know, it can be reasonable or it can be crazy expensive yeah. depending on where you put it. Uh, so so um, we did get a plane. I found a, an instructor, which we have several instructors around who were super to deal with uh, and and just finally did. Um, last year wound up getting my, you know, cause you have to go through several things. So it takes a while, right? Sure. Uh, so you, you have to do a written exam. You have to pass that at a certain percentage. And then you have to go through all the flight training. And then you have to do an oral exam with a designated pilot examiner from the FAA. And then you have to do a check ride, which is where they put you through all kinds of stuff, engine outs, you know, 180s and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, diverge, diverting to a different airport and steep turns and all kinds of stuff, you know, just your standard, uh, standard stuff. And then if you pass all that, then they, they do the yay barrel and you're a, a licensed pilot. So I've done that. I've also passed the instrument uh, rating written exam. I haven't done anything really toward that. Uh, just a matter of time, you know, um, sure. at some point, at some point. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's oddly um, energizing. Uh, it takes a lot of, of mental uh, effort because you, you're, you're, uh, you're either focusing on a, a glass panel, which has a lot of information displayed or on multiple instruments and potentially like another panel, you know, and so there are a lot of inputs that you're, you're watching as well as watching airspace and airspeed and, and your altimeter and, and your bank angles and stuff. So there are, there are a lot of things going on and yet it's oddly calming. It's sure. oddly uh, centering. So you, uh, my wife and I, we don't get to go up as often as we'd like, admittedly, it's just a matter of time and, and decent weather and stuff like that. But when we get an opportunity, like we went up Saturday morning, it was just really pleasant. The air, of course, wintertime uh, is, is terrible for, you know, like comfort uh, <laughs> when you're getting out there and pre-flighting the airplane because you have to do the walk arounds and check the fuel and check the oil levels and tires and all that stuff. Uh, but but once you're in the plane, of course, you're warm. Um, but but the air, when it's cold, is dense, which okay. means that your your takeoff performance and your, your climb performance is just like right up, you know, versus... Uh, in really hot air, your what they call density altitude is higher, so therefore your uh, your airplane doesn't breathe as well. I'm simplifying, but but it doesn't. It just takes longer to climb. It's harder to climb. Uh, but in in cold dense air, it's it's not as bumpy in in many sure. cases, and your performance is better. So it's just a really pleasant flight. Uh, so we flew a nice low pass, you know, or not not low pass, but you know, low altitudes, and just flew around over fields and towns and whatever. And it's nice. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a hobby. It's something to do and, sure. and you can go places. And, uh, when you fly into small general aviation airports, uh, you don't have security lines. Uh, yes, you literally point. fly right in, you, you fuel up or you, you check in at the, the fixed base operator, you, you go inside, you, you mask. I mean, you know, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't the wild west. Um, but you're, um, you're, you park on the ramp, you walk in, you it's, it's unfettered. Uh, I have flown into class, a class Bravo airspace, St. Louis, uh, Labor International. Uh, I intended to do others, but it's just, again, it's time. You just, right. you know, um, and you can anytime. I mean, I can fly into O'Hare tomorrow if I wanted to, but the problem is of course, uh, during the daytime, it can get rather busy with busy. jets and you busy. don't want to have to put them in the position of, of having to navigate you around and stuff. I mean, when I flew into St. Louis, uh, I mean, this was, you know, uh, traffic was low and all that. It was just a really kind of an off chance. Uh, and I still had to divert. They, they lined me up, uh, the approach lined me up on one runway. And then when I, they switched me to tower, tower frequency, they said, uh, well, we have another one uh, jet coming in. Can you move over to this other runway? So of course, then you, you circle back and go over and do that. And it was fine, you know, but, uh, but you imagine that multiplied by a certain, you know, much higher level of traffic and, right, and uh, right. activity. So. And much bigger planes. 
Yeah, you know, and, and there is such a thing called wake turbulence, which means yep. that, you know, if you have this big plane that's that's cutting down and crossing, you know, your the wake behind it drops behind it. Well, if you get caught in that, it can literally flip your small plane. It, it, mm-hmm. I mean, they're, you know, you, you just try to avoid things like that as a general right. <laughs> So, But it's a lot of fun. And, and uh, my wife and I do enjoy going in when our dog is a great traveler. She likes to go on car rides. She likes to go on plane rides and just sacks. You know, she just goes to sleep in the back. Nice. So must be something in the water because I, I've got another friend that's a relative neighbor of yours in the St. Louis area. And he is also a licensed pilot. Actually, he'll be on the show next Ken? month. Uh, yeah, Ken Sy. Yeah, yeah. Ken's a great guy. I've, I've chatted with him. In fact, I chatted with him before I got my license. And I was like, do you think I'm nuts? And he's like, yep, come yep. on. <laughs> but come on along. You know, that's that's what you got to be in this line of work. You know, yeah. Yes, it is. But but it is it is kind of cool. And uh, it does tend to, to chop uh, distances down. I mean, rough rule of thumb by the time you factor in pre-flights and all that stuff is is you can cut your time in half so if sure. you were going to drive somewhere in four hours um total end-to-end time including pre-flight and stuff maybe two uh okay. so that's kind of nice um yeah. i can i could fly i i really haven't but i could fly uh to several states in the surrounding area in in an hour to two hours sure. I mean, several states so well i will say there actually is a a local airport very close to my house. So if you oh, ever yeah. need to get out of the house and you want to fly up, <laughs> you're, and Sipe has threatened to do this before and, and has not followed through. So if you ever want to land at my little airport, I will happily come pick you up. So, Okay. So so now I have to ask, what's the name of this airport? Um, yes. I'd, I'd have to look it up, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't 100% know because I've just... All right. Well, you're going to have though. to send it to me. I will, I'll because... figure it out. I'll get you the info. It, it has a concrete runway. I'll tell you that much. I, I have a, what, what town are you near? I guess, let me ask you that. If, if Forest you Lake. Might, what is it? Forest Lake. Two words. Forest, Forest Link? Lake, as in, you know, Lake, trees Forest and Lake. water. Because okay. that's what Lake. we have in Minnesota. Lots of trees and water. Forest Lake, Minnesota. Okay, so that's I'm me. pulling it up on the Googs. Oh, it's uh, all about the Google. And, and see if I can find, because sometimes, I mean, airstrips are very hard to spot. Sometimes see, they're not, now, I've you, not. You talk about, you talk about golf as a hobby versus flying as a hobby. But now, now here's, <laughs> Here's one thing I'm going to tell you about golf. If I don't pick up my clubs for a couple months and I go out and play golf, I might be a little sore in the morning. I might not have a great round, but that's kind of like the limit of what can go wrong. If you don't <laughs> stay current on your piloting skills, yeah, you, know, you, don't, that. you don't get in the cockpit for a couple months and you get up there and you make a mistake, like bad things happen, man. Well, I, let me, let me, I, I think. So keep you... practicing is what I'm saying, Mark. Well, it's a good excuse to actually get up and go somewhere, even if it's just right. a matter of flying somewhere. They, there's a thing in the aviation community called the hundred dollar hamburger, uh, and that's it's not because the burger is that high. It's that by the time you actually, you know, fly somewhere and and eat and fly right. back, you know, of course you always two people because you very rarely just go for a burger yourself or whatever. But it it's a hundred bucks, you know, sure. uh, which isn't a crazy night out, really. I mean, let's face it, you can easily. Well, drop more than that. I know, I know how you eat, Nate, and you you like really quality food, and that's good. That's good. You know, a nice menu. Uh, but a hundred dollars hey, is you've cheap. You've taken right? advantage of that more than once. I have. On I am. Who, who takes care of mis- you? In case you mistook that for complaining, yeah. don't. Just making sure. <laughs> but anyway, sure. I, I do have a simulator over here, as you can see that side. Yeah. So I even when the weather's cruddy, the time doesn't permit and all that, I do like to get on the sim. Nice. Uh, and, and that keeps me, it's not the same. I, sure. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's just not the same. But it does keep you kind of your, your muscle memory where you've got things kind of working in the right direction. It's not a, where you feel like, what's this funny looking thing I'm supposed to right. hold on to. Um, so it does help. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you want to, I, you know, you're, they always say passengers, which I, I haven't taken a lot of passengers. I mean, my wife's pretty much it and, and dog, uh, but they always say passengers judge you on how, uh, how smooth you fly and how smooth you land uh, and everything else is kind of relative, right? It's like, oh, you know, it's all right. Um, but um, uh, my daughter, uh, we took her for a, a tour around the St. Louis arch because uh, they're, well, like most cities will have, and, and landmarks will have these flight paths. Sure. Uh, I, I don't want to call them anything more than that, but I mean, the, there's a, there's one along the Chicago uh, uh, skyline, the Lakeshore area, where you can fly along and it's a VFR corridor that you can fly through and just, it's, the, the view is beautiful. I haven't ever done that myself, but one of these days I'll, I'll have the excuse to do that. Uh, but you can also fly down around the arch. And there's a little class, well, little, uh, it's very active. It's one of the oldest ones in the U.S., 
but it's a class Delta airport right there, parks, um, St. Louis downtown parks. Uh, and, and so you kind of have to watch that because you have to, to make sure you're, you're not, uh, you know, entering their space without being sure. cleared in and all this. But, but typically if the traffic's not too bad, if you don't have a lot of crazy, you know, jets coming in and out around from Lambert, uh, you can do this nice little loop around the, the St. Louis Arch and fly down the, up and down the river and just gorgeous views. So that we did. We took my, uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter for a, a flight uh, right before Christmas. And it was funny because uh, the next time she got on a commercial flight, uh, she, she pinged me and said, you know, your, your landing was smoother than the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, and of course, I mean, there's several things that go into that. You know, he could have had a horrible, turbulent day. Ours was a nice day for flying. You know, it's still mostly still there. It wasn't, you know, the three or four knots. It wasn't wasn't much of a wind. Uh, so, I mean, it wasn't like it was all my skill, but but it felt good. You know, so, right, <laughs> I'm not right, going to lie. Right. It felt good. So, uh, well, yeah. Paul wants to know if you've ever flown through or under the arch. Speaking of. Uh no somebody's uh, had to it, try that right i mean it, somebody uh, stupid yeah, enough to you know it's quite illegal to do that uh yeah, the I faa hope. takes a really dim view of stuff like that uh it has no been one done, could I have think. predicted I, this i yeah really i mean that's one of those things that when people say if you could do anything if you could fly anywhere would it be in i mean several people always come up with you know just one time i'd like to thread that needle it would just be so much fun uh but uh that said there I, there have been times where people have flown under bridges uh, in the St. Louis area, and and I think even flown through the arch, but I I think that's been like I don't know decades ago when somebody sure. did that. I, I I looked it up, uh, and I think somebody even wrote an article about it in one of the flying magazines a, a, a year or two ago. But what's really crazy, if you want to hear crazy, um, people have flown under the Eiffel Tower, uh, and what? and yeah, it's oh it's it's there was a I think it was a an American after World War II who did it. Uh, but there, the first guy who did it there's was one of the not French. A lot aces. of room there. Wow. There's not. There's not. But there, there was a French World War One ace. Uh, they, they wanted to invite, uh, as, as I remember, and you can look this up. As I'm probably a little off on details, but probably not too far, because they wanted to invite this guy and his squadron because they were they were aces and they were like the cream of the crop. The French really were in World War One at least the, the kind of the leading aces. And I mean, we came on the Brits, several others who did amazing things. There were amazing pilots all around, uh, and of course the Germans, as as you know. I mean, my gosh, I, I read a little history, and and I'm a history nut as well as an aviation nut, so these these things intersect. Uh, but um, you know, obviously everybody knows the Red Baron, Baron von mm -hmm. Richthofen, you know, on the German side, and and uh, Eddie uh, Rickenbacker on our side, and you know, so on and so forth. But there, this French ace. Uh, they wanted these aces to come and march in the parade to to celebrate the the victory in World War One. They didn't want them to fly, which ticked off the aviators something fierce because they're like, you know, march. I mean, we're you know being stuck in with everybody else. This isn't this isn't even what we did in the war. This makes right. no sense. So so they hatched this plan to where this guy was going to fly under the the uh, Eiffel Tower, and I think on one of the practice runs, he crashed, if I remember, or maybe it was flying through the Arc de Triomphe. That's what it was. Uh, the, the Eiffel Tower is it's actually- less room there. Yeah, the Eiffel Tower is actually wider than you'd think. So, right. so I, I think that's happened a few times, but but the Arc de Triomphe, de Triomphe um, I'm killing this French, I'm sorry. It's, I'm out of practice and I'm not good anyway. But, uh, but, he, but he worked out uh, and I think he crashed on one of the, the practice runs, not flying through it, but, but somewhere nearby after or before or something. But one of his squadron mates did it, uh, and there's actually video somebody wow. captured in from 19 what is it 21 or whatever, sure. uh, where this guy flew through, and and of course the old biplanes, of course, which you know you had more wing surface stacks, yeah. so that they weren't as long winged, uh, but he managed to to again thread the needle, and it's just crazy to see some of these people do this insane stuff. But if you want to see insane, look up some crop duster videos because these oh, people sure. have no fear. Oh my gosh, <laughs> they like fly under power lines at the ends of fields. And it's like, you know, I mean, it, this holy mackerel. No, now, I, I, I'm a, a sane uh, pilot. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I mean, you can actually do aerobatics and stuff like that. And, and frankly, when I took my, my private pilot um, training, you do have to do uh, unusual attitude recoveries and things like that. And I, I actually was surprised I'm pretty good at that, which sure. I mean, you don't, um, until you try something, you don't know if you'll be great or horrible or anything in between. But I was surprised that I could uh, so quickly assess where I was and write the airplane. Uh, 
uh, which is is comforting in case anything were to ever happen. But that said, I have no necessarily desire to do aerobatics either. No. So. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> the only aerobatics I plan to do is like, oh my God, how did I get in this situation? How do I get out of it? You know, how do I fix it? So, well, Paul says apparently there's a a uh, wonderful pilot who likes to land right next to him on on the the river and while he's kayaking. So apparently that's oh. that must be a thing to to buzz Paul while you're while you're landing. So, well, who would not want to? He's probably heard about Paul's excellent barbecuing. So I'm sure he's, he's like, like, dude, give me some. I heard about this yeah, award-winning I, queso. I'm right here. Chop chop. <laughs> What's it going to take? And yes, I would like some queso ice cream. Thank you for asking. Yes. But, yes, yeah. Um well, yeah, I mean there are some really cool amphibious planes too, like the the Icon A5 is one that's the one that um uh, who is the pitcher who died in tech and ten, uh, sorry, not Texas, not Tennessee in Florida. Um, a couple years ago, uh, sure. he was a former major league pitcher. Uh, he had all kinds of, I don't want to say too much, but I mean, he had, there were several substances found in his bloodstream. Ah. He, he had flown, um, probably fine flying flown in, in ways that were certainly, not rated by the aircraft structure and whatnot. Um, and of course it, it ended very badly. It's sad. It's truly sad. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, these airplanes are, are super, super nice and, and you can just set them down on lakes, ocean, whatever. And then there, there's another kind, I don't remember what kind it is. It's similar where you can just coast it right in. I've seen them actually on the Mississippi river here, which is oh, amazing because sure. that river is, um, uh, it's it's quite aggressive as, <laughs> as rivers go, at least at this point. I mean, obviously, yeah. in the headwaters, it's not much to you know, not much current and stuff. But here, it's a little dangerous, and you see them coming in, landing here all the time. So, yeah, we get that off a lot of our lakes, at least the bigger ones. That's a fairly common thing to see. But... Yeah, yeah, seaplanes are beautiful. I really, I, I love the look of them, but it's, I've never been necessarily that excited about landing or taking off on water. So, well, I can't let us finish without you mentioning uh, a new book that I hear is doing quite well yeah. on various lists of bestsellers. Oh, so oh, hold that thought. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me grab one and I'll, I'll show you. It's I'm so excited about this. Right. I need to see one, a copy of this, please. Yes. One moment, please. please. And, and I don't appreciate Paul telling me I need some kind of lesson in unusual attitude training. I'll tell you about unusual attitudes. People these days, I tell you, it's good times. I'm actually a little surprised Mark didn't just, you know, have a couple copies of that book sitting over his shoulder the entire time we've been on the air. That's that's like classic Room Raider 101. You know, most okay, people would well, have had it just already ple present. I'm I'm failing. Clearly, I'm failing. It's I, okay. I should be better about promoting this. I mean, I'm I pretty um, sure I mentioned that when I reached out to get you to schedule this thing. So you, know. you did. I just uh, brain cramp here, but it's yeah. fine. So so this is it. Spring boot up and Yay. running. Let me, see, let, me, let me move it in here. I'll I'll put it where. It, yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's better, that's yeah. a much better view. So, oh, we should have done that the whole time. So yeah, um, you know, I guess the first thing that people ask is what kind of animal. This is very critical. This is a pectoral sandpiper. Uh, since I own a Piper aircraft, uh, I wanted a Piper for the, nice. the cover. I think that's a, a nice little tie-in. Uh, and and actually, you know, whenever you write a book, and you are well known for your massive pecs. So, yes, yes, yeah, I I get that all the time too. But um, uh, <laughs> that's why I have such I, a hard time finding shirts. You yes, and the tell rock. me how much to Ven Venmo you later, mate. Uh, <laughs> But no, I, you know, anytime you do a, a session, anytime you write a book, anytime you write a blog post, there has to be some, some context, some domain that you're working with. And again, loving aviation. Uh, I actually have a couple devices, a couple small devices. Let's see, you can see the one with the green lights back there. The other one's kind of tucked away, but uh, these track aircraft in the area. So aircraft oh, yeah. uh, in the U.S. have uh, a requirement called ADSB, the Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast out is the requirement you don't have to have in although it's super helpful in many in, in so many ways but out it lets you you know it's like a radar assist uh, i thought in, software in had a lot of acronyms man oh yeah i mean it's <laughs> so many so many parallels what do you think i like it uh but uh but uh yeah it's uh so you have to have a domain and i thought well you know i i i track these flights that fly over my house anyway why don't i just use those as the data feed because you're always trying to come up with some data feed to pass the data around and to manipulate right. it and see what you can do with it and and i love coffee and i've used coffee for a long time and i, I actually thought you know people would probably be getting tired of hearing me talk about coffee interestingly that's not the case because now i have people going hey when are you gonna you know why, why aren't you talking coffee and it's like well i can do both that's good <laughs> but but i it's it's 
it's always more interesting, at least to me, when you have live data. Yeah. So if you have data that's actually real and fresh and current, it's just cooler, right? So I, I wrote this application that harvests the data off that and then uh, lets me provide that as a feed to whatever else. So I wrote uh, several different examples of doing different things with that data feeding in uh, for the Spring Boot Up and Running book. That's awesome. And the idea for this, I, and I always tell people, you know, every author, well, you know, you're an author, every author has a different perspective. And it doesn't mean that every other author's perspective is wrong. It just means that every one of us makes certain uh, choices and trade-offs right. and we, you know, things that I view as super important, you may view as, well, that's useful. It's helpful, but it's not that important. So I'm going to focus on other things, or maybe we agree that this thing is super important, but we have different perspectives on how to present it, how to, how to explain it. Yep. And, and if there's a gap, if, if five other people have written about topic X and, and, and Nate Shuda looks at this and goes, yeah, but you know, that's not how it clicked for me. So if I add my voice to this, I think it'll actually help some people that's important for you to do that. Right. So, so over the last few years, I've kind of collected, you know, questions people have asked, asked for explanations, things like that. And, and I thought, you know, at some point, one of these days, I'll write this thing. Well, that became a reality. So uh, it gave me a chance to kind of capture these things. And from my unique and strange perspective, and, and hopefully add to uh, add, some, you know, some, some details to the discussion. So right. it was a cool book. It was a lot of fun to, to write. Uh, but you automatically have to choose what goes in and how you present it. So I've already started the list on things that I want to cover in a subsequent effort, whether it's a book or videos or, or whatever. Um, but you know, you can't do it all. You just kind of have to scope it and, and go with that. So yep. it's, it was a good time and, and, uh, good feedback so far. It, it actually has bounced any bounces around like all books, you know, one day it's number one, next yeah. day it's number nine, next day it's number two, next day it's number 17, the next day it's number one again. Yep. Uh, and it's across like three or four different categories. It's hit number one or is at number one uh, at various times. And, and it's just kind of cool. I, I appreciate the, the love. Uh, and again, it's, it's more a matter of maybe, you know, just adding a different voice, but, yeah. but there's so much wealth in the spring boot and spring ecosystems that, that it's just a joy to, to, to write and talk about and explore. And, and I hope that my excitement comes through because I have a good time with this. Again, I, I look at that, you know, that, that amount, that mound of technology that I haven't discovered yet, or yes. that maybe I discovered, forgot, come back. And it's like, gee, I wish there was a way to do this. And you go, well, have you tried this? Like, I even have a project I did that. And I completely forgot about that. And it's just like, you, you found a new Easter egg, you know, it's like, yep. wow, this is great. Uh, so hopefully I was able to, to share that, that excitement and love because there's a lot there. It's a lot of, a lot of fun to, to work with. And well, super I, I joined Paul in asking when are our signed copies going to show up? I mean, what's it uh, going to take? Who's a guy got to know <laughs> to get their hands on a signed copy of this to go along with, you know, the other books from our other spring authors that I know. Well, I, I mean, out. I'm happy to do that, but I have to caution you that actually putting my signature on it will reduce the value somewhat. I, I understand. So I'm, I'm willing to accept aware. that loss in value. Yeah. You know. <laughs> there's, there's a difference between a signature and a, and an autograph. And sadly, mine is just a signature. So, it, you Fair know, point. you'd think Fair that point. would be like, well, at least it won't, it may not gain anything, but it won't lose, but that's not necessarily the case. So keep that in mind. We can, we can talk offline, but uh, yeah, keep in mind. We'll, I, we'll bring that I up in still, the Slack channel. We'll, uh, I, I, I do still count you as friends and I want to keep it that way. So, sure, that's you know, fair. I, I don't have to sign these things. That's, that's fine. <laughs> well, my friend, I could talk with you for another hour, but I'm sure that you have other things to do. I should probably have some lunch. You know, we didn't talk about yeah. food. I think this is one of the few times we didn't talk about food, but we talked about coffee, although not for as much as I would have expected. I, I, we probably could have done an hour on coffee and, you know, somehow managed not to. So you're welcome internet. I kind of thought we were going to do that. So I, you know, I, I know this sounds weird. I mean, you know, people look at zooms and they go, Oh, I've got to do a zoom meeting, you know, for whatever, fill in the blank and with, with whomever fill in the blank. And, and I was really looking forward to this because it has been a, a long time since you and I've caught up. And, and for those of you who don't know, who aren't aware, uh, you know, well, you, you know, we used to travel extensively, go here, there and everywhere. But, but typically when we would land in a new place, uh, Nate, Paul, and I, at least, and several others too. I mean, you know, Josh and Jake or Jakob, gosh, I just went, went blank here. I'm anglicizing everything. But, uh, but you know, you'd have a, a, you know, you'd try to coordinate and connect to grab coffee, but almost invariably, 
uh, when it all came down to it, the people who are the most caffeine obsessed would be you, Paul, and me. Right. So at some point, we're going to be meeting up at a coffee shop, yes. and we're going to be sampling different, uh, you know, straight black coffees and lattes and flat whites and uh, just whatever. And uh, it's good to catch up because it has been too forever since been. we've done this. It has been. So well, yeah, I was really looking forward to this. To, to that point, I think that's our team's superpower is we will find the best coffee <laughs> in whatever city we happen to be in, even if that oh, means yes. it's, you know, in a high-end car dealership, like the one time we were in Johannesburg. Yep. But anyway, <laughs> well, Mark, thank you, my friend. It was good catching up with you as well. And I look forward to more Twitter chats around coffee, I'm sure in our future. So I, I appreciate Likewise. that. It was it was fun this morning to have have quite a back and forth on on various coffees. But with with that, I suppose we should probably probably have some hive trainings that we we need to attest to. Did you have to go there? Did oh, you that's really? Paul's fault. That's all Paul's fault. So he, <laughs> he reminded me that we have hive trainings that we need to complete. So I'm, well, know. I I'll just leave it at nothing says Happy New Year like getting a yes. you know yes. a hive training notification on January first. Yeah, I still can't so. get my head wrapped around that one. Like they waited until <laughs> January first. That's where that one kicks in. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That That's makes like, sense. You know, I know these things are automated, but you know, schedule them for a non holiday. <laughs> yeah, you would think. You would think. So Mary, thank oh, well. you for joining us. Appreciate it as well. Paul, Tasha, it's a sweet killer. Six was with us today. Appreciate that, friends. And uh, next week, we've got another Mark, a different Mark, a different instance of Mark. Mark Richards, good friend, software architect mm. extraordinaire, will be joining us. So I'm looking forward to that. But Mark, thanks again, my friend. And, uh, you know, look forward to seeing you in person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say in 2021, you and I will be in the same, same meet space. Well, I feel let's confident. Hope. I hope so. Let's hope. I hope so. All and right, my yeah, friend, you take care to, of yourself. Great to chat with you and great to have everybody on here. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.